In 2014, a new mom looked around and found herself surrounded by nothing but disapproval when she was breastfeeding in public. This mom was no ordinary mom. This mom decided to do something about it. She was a photographer, so she already had her camera and now she had a purpose. She strapped her baby on her back, went on a journey and took beautiful photos of mothers breastfeeding in public. She wanted to inspire other mothers and she wanted to get society's attention on the difficulties those moms were facing. Her photos went viral and got featured in Forbes, Elle and Cosmopolitan. She started a movement overnight. This movement is now almost synonymous with public breastfeeding itself. And I am sure you have all heard these two words, normalize breastfeeding. My guest today is no other than the fantastic Vanessa Simmons, founder of the normalized breastfeeding movement. We'll talk about her journey in the last eight years, what has been achieved and what is still a challenge and what the movement is focusing on now. We'll talk about how the era of social media might have taken the power out of images, but it opened the possibility of telling stories, the story of each and every single mom. Vanessa is just as inspirational as ever, leading by the example of her own struggles and own personal growth. Now she's teaching moms how to tell their own stories. You can check out the Normalized Breastfeeding Movement, her trainings and her upcoming book in the description below. And now sit back and enjoy the talk. I am here today with Vanessa Simmons. Vanessa, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, allow me to start with a personal note. Uh, my son was born in 2014, the year you started the normalized breastfeeding campaign. And I was a first time mom with huge doubts. Uh, but when the photos of breastfeeding mom started to trend, I suddenly belonged to a community that was invisible until then. And I wanted to thank you for that because it really put my mind at ease about breastfeeding in public. But how about society itself? Eight years on, have we normalized breastfeeding? How do you see it? Uh, I would say that this is a very multi-layered topic, right? And so uh, I think that we've come a long way but we still have a long way to go. (laughs) If you you look at it, if we try to be positive, right? Like let's look at the bright side. You know, we have done some really great work in bringing the images to the media and bringing them to the forefront. And now it's influencing advertising, right? It's it's influencing uh, different spaces like uh, colleges and how they are uh, setting up spaces for, young moms to be able to pump their milk, right? Uh, Airports have more pods now that are allowing women to be able to have a a private place if they don't want to breastfeed in public. Uh, But it's a very, very multi-layered issue. And so let's start with what that looks like, right? We have that main issue of public breastfeeding awareness, and that's what everyone is kind of focused on. It's like, okay, well, the moms are on one side saying, I need to be able to breastfeed my baby in public because this is the most normal, natural thing, right? And then there's the public who's like, I don't want to see your breasts in public, right? Like, I don't want to see them while I'm eating my burger. And then (laughs) moms come back and they're like, but you look at burgers when we're selling food on on TV ads, or you look at breasts, or you look at breasts when you're eating burgers on TV ads, right? So what's the difference, right? And it's like, there's this huge, like, like everyone's at war about it, but the reality was all moms are really trying to say, because I don't think the public understood what we were trying to say. All we were trying to say is that we know that you might not like it, but this is what our baby needs right now. And we don't care how you feel about it because we're going to feed our child. So if you have a problem with that, you know, take it up with the breast, you know, the state laws, right? The laws protect us to breastfeed in public and it's as needed. So if the baby is crying, I mean, I don't know who would rather listen to a baby scream their head off in public than allow a mom to just latch the baby on and be done with it. Like, 
you, as a breastfeeding mom, and I want to say thank you for saying thank you to me, because that means so much to me to know that at that time when I started the campaign, because I was also like very unsure of, should I do this? Like I was mm-hmm. still in a place in that place too. The fact that I started it and now you're saying that you, you were right there when it was happening, that means so much to me. And this, 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 this way that we've kind of been going back and forth as a society of, is it okay? And what do you think? And what's your opinion? It's like, listen, milk was created to sustain the life that you carry. That's why it's there. It's literally there to make sure this baby doesn't die. And if the mother's unable to breastfeed, yes, we do have other options, but that is why the milk develops. That's why it's produced by the body, right? Baby is born. And then we know that pro- prolactin and oxytocin and they kind of take over and make sure that this milk is produced so that the baby can have the milk that it needs to be sustained. And so it's, it, it's come down to uh, in society, like, like, is it okay? Like people are asking like other people's opinions, all right? Like if people, like, let's say the news does a post about it on Facebook, they're not asking what do you know about breastfeeding, right? Like, do you know the benefits? They're trying to, to like ignite like a social media like problem <laughs> by asking, what do you think? Is this okay for moms mm-hmm. to breastfeed in public, right? Like, how would that make you feel? And it's like, but that's not what it's about. And that's not what we're saying. We're not saying, you know, I really want you to feel bad right now because I need to breastfeed my baby. It's like, no. I'm telling you that my baby's hungry or my baby's thirsty or my baby is teething or my baby needs comfort. And all of the different ways that I can give those things to my child comes through my breast naturally. So naturally I'm going to breastfeed in public, right? Cause that's I have my funny. baby with me. So um, yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it on that mm-hmm. layer. The, the two other layers I just want to touch on really quickly are that the family support and accountability right? That's another layer of has it been normalized. There's some families that don't support the mothers and women in their family who choose to breastfeed and breastfeed openly, right? And then there's also the peer-to-peer judgment and lack of support that happens among mothers, where there are some mothers who are like, you know, let's say they breastfed, you know, over a decade ago. Oh, I used a cover. It's not that big of a deal, right? And it's like, but I'm telling you that it is a big deal for me. So the, I think the normalization has definitely multi layers and it needs to be addressed on, on, on every layer. Right. And from your experience, it sounds like that the real pushback, the biggest pushback that you might have experienced is actually from the public, from the people itself. So you have met a lot of people in power and in conferences who are all kind of positive and supporting of breastfeeding itself. But it, when, when it comes to society itself, that's where you experience the most pushback on it. I mean, I would say the majority of the hate came from other women who didn't want their husbands or boyfriends to see the breasts of the woman who was nursing. Right. That was where I, I, I really... It was a struggle for me because I was just really just on social media, just looking for support for myself too. Right. I was nursing Mm -hmm. my baby and I was like, you know, this is great. I have support and I can offer support and this is, this is all love. But the, when, when the, the posts started to explode and go viral for all the wrong reasons, when I went through the comments, the majority of the people were women talking about their husbands or their boyfriends and talking about how they didn't want, or they didn't want their children to see another woman's breast. And it's like, but you don't want your children to know that that's how a baby is fed. Like Mm -hmm. on this campaign of touring around the country and taking photographs of families uh, breastfeeding, I've actually bumped into children who have told me before, before my mom started breastfeeding, I never knew you could actually feed a baby with your breast. The child said that, right? So for her to have that epiphany, and she's a she's a girl, so one day she's going to feed her child. Imagine if she had never seen it. Imagine right. if she just never knew it was something that actually happened. So to say that they didn't want it to happen in front of their children was actually very erroneous, I think. And it was 
uh, something that made me start looking more deeply into the women and the other, you know, the peers, what's going on in this, this peer network. Yeah. And it's not even just women who, who don't have children yet. It's actual moms. some of the ones yes actual moms exactly mm -hmm. it was the like I said the peers so the other moms that that let's say they maybe they did breastfeed maybe they didn't either way let's say they breastfed and they were like well I always used a sheet I always covered up my baby or I always went into a private place right um or the yeah. ones who didn't breastfeed you know oh you know you're just trying to get attention and right. Like you're, you're here trying to show everyone that you're breastfeeding and, and maybe they just were dealing with some trauma around the fact that they weren't able to breastfeed their own child. Like, I think that's something that we don't really look at when it comes to postpartum health and mental health and mental wellness. It's like, that's a traumatic experience to give birth to a child Hopefully the birth was natural, but let's say it was even an emergency birth. And then to also not be able to breastfeed, that's a traumatic experience. And I don't think that they know that they've been dealing with, you know, trying to overcome the trauma. Yes. Um, what does your movement do at the moment? Are there any specific aims you are focusing on? I mean, it started eight years ago. I'm sure the aims and objectives have shifted. Uh, moved forward during this time? They really have shifted over the years. So in the beginning, it started out as just a, a photo project. I was just kind of like, let's see what we can do. Let's see what kind of images we can make. Uh, as the Facebook page started to really take off, a lot of people started asking for support through the the inbox, through the, the private messages. And so I would just post, you know, their questions to the community and the community would answer them and people would get a lot of really great support and feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. From there, we decided to create the International Day to Normalize Breastfeeding, which was in June. It's now in August. It's the third August of, um, or sorry, the third Saturday in August every right. year now. So now it's during breastfeeding month. And, um, you know, that was, that was kind of our yearly event that we had going, uh, for quite some time and we still celebrate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now it, since the pandemic hit and we were all kind of forced into, you know, forced inside and, and had no way to really connect with one another, I became, really concerned about what this would mean for the community. And so I started creating workshops and uh, these workshops are really to help families to look at whatever the topic is about. So like I have one right now on hand expression, uh, the milk and honey uh, hand expression workshop. And I also have one on sleep, the, the sound asleep solution. Those mm -hmm. two workshops are focused on helping families to align with the ancient wisdom of nurturing. And the purpose of that really is instead of focusing on all of the different things that we've been told about what breastfeeding needs to look like or what sleep needs to look like, right? Instead of doing that, what would happen if we were kind of in a, because I, I kind of referred to the pandemic as like a postpartum experience, right? This is like the OG mm -hmm. postpartum, like postpartum is being stuck in the house, right? That is right. what it is, right? So I started to say, what would happen if instead of we, us trying to make breastfeeding look a certain way or make sleep look a certain way, what would happen if we decided to align ourselves with that ancient wisdom of nurturing that's already embedded in us that our baby can teach us, right? Because if we start to listen more to our baby's needs, at such a young age from when they're born, we have a deeper connection with them and also a deeper connection to who we really are inside of us, like our intuition, right? And so those workshops, you know, they definitely teach the mechanics of, you know, safe sleep and the mechanics of hand expression, but they also help to change perspective and build awareness around the fact that what you've been taught is a lie. Like your baby's not going to sleep through the night at six months. They're just not right. They might right. one day, right? Yeah. Like one night, maybe out of like six months, they might sleep through the night, but if you're lucky if you're very lucky. Right. And there are some babies that just sleep through the night, right? That's possible, but it's not, it's not common. Right. So we need to stop giving them this idea 
that babies are going to just sleep through the night. And so what I teach them is you need to understand what your baby is looking for out of sleep and when your baby is looking to get sleep. And then you align yourself with that. So if your baby has this routine that's already going, you just jump on board, right? And you just mm-hmm. get in there and, and try to get a couple of winks in while your baby's sleeping. Obviously, you can't do that every single time your baby goes down. But I teach a lot of different techniques of how to manage that and how to make sure that you're getting sleep because going out without sleep is what led me into postpartum depression and psychosis with my first baby. And I was hospitalized four times because of it. And so it's not something that anyone wants to go through. And I just, I felt really compelled to teach uh, about, about sleep. I think that's fantastic how you are actually from your own experiences were able to build such a program where moms can almost grow together with their babies. Yes. You mentioned that, you know, the whole movement started off with taking those beautiful photographs. At that time, uh, you started the movement, the social media was in its infancy, and we weren't swimming in the sea of images every single day. But now posting breastfeeding photos is a very common place. Mm-hmm. And um, as you mentioned as well, there's a lot of negative comments that moms give to moms, but also you can see a lot of uh, images being sexualized. Did you ever encounter this issue? And what are your thoughts about it? How moms can protect themselves when they see this sort of uh, misuse of pictures? You know, it's something that has really affected me as a portrait photographer and someone who creates imagery to give families a keepsake right? Something Mm -hmm. beautiful to keep and to put on their wall. Um, It's actually very, it's very damaging to see how people can take these images and just completely pervert them, right? And so um, what I can say to anyone who's listening, who may have experienced this or has seen this happen in the past, if your intuition is telling you to stop posting these photos, just listen to your intuition, Because I've come to a place now where I'm not willing to, like, I'm not going to delete my pictures, Mm -hmm. but I don't feel comfortable posting them anymore because I don't want something like that to happen with one of my photos. And then it ends up harming a family that I worked with, that we had a good relationship. Like that's what I'm more concerned about now. And I just, Mm -hmm. my prayer every day is that something like this doesn't happen to our platform where the the pictures get hijacked and they get used in a certain kind of way. Like, I I don't know. But what I will say is that personally, I dealt with this on YouTube. I actually created a hand expression tutorial um, long before I created the workshop. And it was just a lot of moms. I had told them, oh my gosh, you guys, I hand expressed four, three ounces of milk in four minutes. And they were like, what? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, they were like, can you show us? Can you show us? And I was like, okay, I'll upload the video to YouTube. So at first the video was private and I had people DMing me and I would give them the private link, right? Um, or unlisted. And it would allow them to be able to look at it one-on-one, but it started to become too many people. And I was like, I, I can't manage this anymore. And so I made the video public. Well, that video right has since been seen like my my lactating breast has been seen more than two million times now (sighs) and I don't know I know what what I do know is that our YouTube channel is actually the majority of the people who are following and subscribed are men I kind of came to a halt when it came to social media I'm not afraid to use the platforms. I'm just right now being very strategic as to how I want to use the platform and what I want to use it for, because I don't want anyone that I come in contact with or that I want to share their images or videos. I don't want anyone to be taken advantage of because that would, that would be, even if they weren't mad at me, I would feel that guilt. You know what I mean? And so um, what I can say is, you know, anyone who feels like they shouldn't post an image, just don't post it, you know, and I'm not saying don't be proud of it, but you have to protect yourself. No one's going to come like, I can't come over there and protect you from someone taking your image, right? What we have to do is 
I do think that the first the first uh, run of the movement was getting it out there, making people aware. And people are definitely aware now, right? Even celebrities were posting images of themselves breastfeeding. At this point, we need to be more strategic about what does this really all mean? Why are we being censored? Like, because that's the real issue. Why are we being censored to think that we have to build awareness in the first place? Like, why was this not already normal? That's that's where I am. That's where I am in this movement. I'm focused on the purpose, that the purpose of breastfeeding is to connect babies to their mothers, to the families, to their communities, and to the world. That is the first point of connection that they have when they leave the womb. What it's doing is these people who are taking these images and now perverting them are trying to pervert that whole entire ripple effect. And so the only way to stop that from happening is to cut it off at the source, right? Don't post the photo. And I'm not saying it in the sense of don't normalize breastfeeding. There's a lot of ways we can normalize breastfeeding. We can normalize breastfeeding by telling our story, right? And so I have a a workshop that'll be coming out soon um, called Speak Mama. And it's all about teaching moms to speak their story and to not rely on the image Because we know that an image is worth a thousand words. You have a thousand words to tell that story and your story can touch people in a way that your image never will, right? And so I learned that myself, right? Saying, uh, speaking my own story. And um, I just think we need to be very strategic at this point in time, because the last thing we want is for our children to grow up and let's say they come across the image that was perverted. What would that mean to our child? Exactly. We have to think forward when we are thinking about these pictures being posted. I think that's fantastic what you mentioned that um, you have this program now that teaches moms how to speak their stories because, yeah, we are swimming in this um, sea of images. But really, what really matters is what what is happening behind that. It's yes. um, that tells so much more. A personal story tells so much more about this. It's such a complex issue. It cannot be really simplified into one image. Although yes. at that time, that image was very, very necessary to yes. kind of trigger the entire, <laughs> the entire thought process and the entire change. Um, uh, you know, back in 2014, when you started this movement, at that time, there were still states in the US where breastfeeding in public was illegal. Do you think yes. uh, the movement itself actually made a proper change? A yeah, proper- I wasn't I wasn't there on the legislative floor, but I was in communication with the people who were. And I was the one posting on the blog. I'll have to send you a link, but there was a blog post that I did um, about the, uh, and I actually did a, a recording for one of our um, international days to normalize breastfeeding. I did a recording with the woman who was actually on the legislative floor and, and, you know, it was just so crucial to, to be connected and have that network at that time of people Mm -hmm. who were really like moving and shaking like the industry, you know? And so I can't, I can't say that, um, you know, that I was, I was, I would say that I was the person who was really, uh, broadcasting the stories, right? Like I was the person who was getting in there and like doing the journalism and finding out like what's going on with this? How is it going to change? Like what what's happening in day to day? You know, we would be in in communication via email. And I, I, I knew what was happening from the very front row, right? And so right. I don't think back then I really thought about like the impact that it was mm-hmm. going to have. But like knowing now, like since, since then I've been able to be interviewed on different different platforms and say, yeah, we're, it's legal in all 50 states. Like get over it. Like, (laughs) you know, like like that's, it's, 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 it's empowering, you know, to know that that is what it is and that it did come from all of us standing together, being united and saying enough is enough. Like all I'm trying to do is feed my baby. Right. And the fact that we even had to fight for that is crazy. It's absolutely insane, you know, but we did it. We pushed through, we won. And it's been a, it's been, it's had a huge impact. I think for the moms, like, like you who have come through um, during the time that we were kind of all doing that work behind the scenes, it's had a huge impact on all of you. And I'm just so grateful to have been a part Um, of it. um, I'm absolutely grateful for you for starting it. 
I don't know what I would have done. Otherwise, I'm sure I would have stopped breastfeeding way earlier because mm-hmm. there was just no examples around me. Um, I also wanted to uh, check with you. I know you have a book coming out. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your book and when it will be out? Yes. So my book is called Latch the Gap, uh, Breaking or sorry, break, from breaking barriers to building bridges within. And so it's interesting. Over the summer, I wrote a book and it was 300 pages and I took it to my publisher and she told me, honey, this is three books. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what? And she said, there are three specific topics in this book. And I think that it would be more powerful if you se- if you split them up and, and publish them one at a time, because people are going to get lost in all of the ideas that you have going in this one book. And they might not read a full 300 pages and they might not get the message. She's like, I want you to break it up into three books. So the first book is actually, it's all going to be latch the gap. So it's a series mm-hmm. and the volume one is, you know, better now do better. And the first volume is really a tribute to my own story of breastfeeding and, and birth and pregnancy, uh, and, and what our family went through during those experiences. And I talk a lot about how my perinatal experiences really were a form of personal development. Like it was an opportunity for me to take a step back each time and look at what I wanted for the next one when I, when, you know, when I was pregnant again and really decide and make some conscious decisions about what I wanted and what I didn't. Right. I, I knew that if I went back to the OBGYN who told me that throwing up eight times a day was normal, (laughs) that I was probably going to end up having some crazy hospital birth, right. Possibly (laughs) emergency, you know, interventions and all these things. And so I had to make a conscious decision to say, no, that's not what I want. And what I really want is a beautiful natural birth, a birth assisted by midwives, the opportunity to be supported by a doula, right? Like Mm -hmm. I had to make a clear decision with purpose in mind, knowing that if I didn't, I could end up in a really bad situation, right? I had to make that decision to say, no, I know that I'm, I'm capable of doing this and this is possible and I'm going to go in that direction. Right. And so that book is, or this book rather is, is all about that. It's all about, uh, and it's dedicated to the black community specifically because we have such terrible disparities when it comes to health in general. And I believe Mm -hmm. that they're all connected back to breastfeeding right? We know that if a mother has a natural birth, she has more chances to have a good breastfeeding experience. But even if she doesn't have a natural birth, if she breastfeeds her baby, she's sharing ages of DNA with her child. That means her child is receiving DNA for those, for those listening who don't know about this, it's called epigenetics. And basically what happens is your, your, baby is connecting the DNA is connecting to the pieces that are from your ancestors. So that, that connection of breastfeeding is not just about the milk and you'll hear that all the time, but nobody really explains to you, well, what, what else is it? Right. You are receiving communication from your ancestors about being with this connection right here with your mother, right? The baby is receiving that, right? And then the mother is receiving healing from those moments of separation that they went through. If you think about, you know, slavery and some of the different things that the Black community has suffered through when it comes to birthing and breastfeeding, these are the things that they are receiving from choosing to breastfeed and being willing to breastfeed. It's a very healing, healing uh, space for for our spam- families specifically. So I talk about how I received healing through breastfeeding and how my children receive healing. And then I talk about uh, how it really empowered me to start this normalized breastfeeding movement because had I not made certain decisions, 
from one pregnancy to the next, I wouldn't have ended up with a baby who was able to latch on immediately, no problem. And then also be able to just kind of sit back and chill and breastfeed. Whereas the previous two, I was running a different appointment, trying to see a lactation educator. No, this time around, I had my midwife. I did it in a birth center. I had a water birth. Baby was born fine. We went to my mom's house. She took care of me for seven days while my family stayed there. Easy peasy. I got to sleep. I got to eat. I got to nurse my baby and heal. Right. And it was just a mind blowing experience, more natural, but so much more supportive. Like I wasn't aware that I needed that support. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that that support was a need. Right. And so because of that support, I actually had the ability, I had the rest and I had the energy to be able to say, wait a minute, what's going on with moms being kicked out of public for breastfeeding. Like, this is crazy. And then that was what sparked that fire in me to say, no, no, I am not going to sit back while I'm breastfeeding my own child and watch women get kicked out of these public spaces. I'm going to put my baby on my back and travel across the country and take pictures of moms while they're breastfeeding so I can raise awareness about the topic, right? Um, that's kind of where it all comes from. So, yeah. <laughs> it, it sounds like a fascinating read. It sounds like a fascinating read. When do you plan to bring it out? So it was supposed to come out in August. That was the goal. But with it, with us deciding to split it up, it's now in the hands of the publisher. So I'm just waiting to get it back. So I don't have a specific publishing date yet, but that date, once it's out, it will be announced on all across all of our platforms Perfect. and, um, and we'll be making it available. So just keep your eyes open. We're going to do a whole launch like a cool little like speaking summit. So I'll be speaking as well. Um, so make sure to, to keep your eyes open for that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the second and the third volume, just roughly what they're going to be about? Definitely. So the second volume has to do with a little bit of the spiritual awakening that I went through during the postpartum depression and psychosis with the first baby while I was in the hospital. And then the third book uh, is all about my journey into purpose and uh, learning how to align myself with what I really wanted for my future. And those books are all, um, you know, it's, it's all one story, but it's like 15 years worth right? Like I can't put that all into one book. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot more juicier if you take the time and read one and then just kind of sit and meditate on that. And it's like, okay, now what else does she have? Right. Because it's a bit, it's a long story, but it's, it's a beautiful one at the same time. And yeah. Really I, that sounds amazing. And I think it also taps into something that is completely underestimated is how big a change, how massive personal change uh in our whole psychology it is to become a mom and how we deal with that and how we develop and how we progress with that new life uh, and I think it's amazing that you do such a deep dive and share it with us so that we can all sort of learn from it and uh, and learn from it from our perspective as well yes so this book is actually well I say this book but you know I'm talking about the series <laughs> Yes. So th these books are actually babies of a course that I taught during the pandemic. I opened up a course for a very intimate group of uh, people and I taught about purpose development. And uh, as I taught that course, I just started to see all of these pieces of myself and just realized like, this needs to be in a book because not everyone's going to take my course. I had to, I kind of started to take steps backward and say, okay, what would I tell this? You know, what do I tell myself if I was pregnant again, or like the, my first baby, right? Like, what would I go back and say to my myself in the past? And so that was kind of how the book was born. Um, but the course, the course is uh, called the purpose passport and it is, an eight week deep dive into those changes that you go through uh, while you're having a baby, but more, more than anything, it's, it's a deep dive into how to care for yourself during that process. A lot of times we get stuck on how do we take care of the baby and we completely forget about ourselves. And it's like, well, once you forget about yourself, like who's really taking care of this baby? Like you're a zombie at that point, right? You're just going through the motions. 
And so uh, the Purpose for Passport really helps to open up people's minds to how self-care is, and I'm not talking about going out and getting your hair done, okay? Like I'm talking about internal self-care is really, it's the foundation of your future. If you don't care for yourself now, you don't even, you have no clue of who you're going to be in your future. But if you're conscious and aware and intentional with how you care for your inner being now, the the future is limitless, right? And so that's what I teach in the course. And and that's what you'll get in these books as well uh, from that perspective as well. That is, that is absolutely fantastic. Vanessa, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate that you were here with us. It's been great. Thank you so much for having me. As Vanessa said, stories will touch people in ways that images will never be able to. Images are great to raise awareness, but stories are needed to show the complexity of a situation. I know many of you might be sharing images and videos on social media. So the next time you do that, why not tell something about your breastfeeding journey? Something that might not be obvious for somebody from the outside. Something that might raise more understanding towards your journey as a breastfeeding mother. As always, you can reach us on the email address below. We'd love to hear from you and leave your thoughts in the comment section. Next week, we will be looking at the impact of media on breastfeeding in public with my guest, Dr. Katie Foss. See you next Monday.